So today I'm heading down to Marin, and we're going to Fairfax to visit the Marin Bicycle Museum. Uh, we're going to be meeting up with Will Clausen, who is going to talk to us about the history of mountain biking, some of the geometry aspects of the early mountain bikes, and uh, then I think we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of mountain bike tires. So let's head over there and see what we can find out. So last time I didn't get a chance to show my Fit Cycles bike, so this time I'm bringing it with me today so that uh, so you can check it out. Here we are uh, with the Fat Tire Collection at the Marin Museum of Mountain Bikes. And this is here the timeline of the early downhill bikes. So right here, this, this is like, let's see, the, the origin of the geometry of the downhill bike and the mountain bike. Ignaz Schwinn in the early 30s came up with this kind of design, kind of to copy a motorcycle and to make a schoolboy bike. Uh, this, th this is the geometry that was pretty much copied by all the early mountain bike manufacturers. This is based on the Schwinn DX. Here's, uh, there's an Admiral and, uh, and this, this other uh, Bluner here. The Admiral DX was your basic downhill bike as, as used by the originators of the mountain bike. This one is a stripped down version of it. The tank is removed and the fenders are removed. It has a, a Schwinn approved front caliper brake on it. As uh, your indestructible schoolboy uh, tires, truck tires, or they call them balloon tires. And that was a, the name was an innovation of Ignaz Schwinn. So this design here of 1940, 41, is their updated design. And, and this geometry right here, if, if you look at the, uh, the wheelbase, the chain stays in the back, the distance between uh, the axles, the, the, the top tube length, the head angle, and the fork rake, and the trail. These uh, were worked out by Ignaz Schwinn to be the ideal all-around geometry for this kind of a heavy-duty bike. Now, when the early mountain bike uh, racers came around and started modifying them, these were the bikes that they'd use. They'd find these uh, $5 bikes in a barn sale. Uh, here's another Schwinn DX Excelsior from, uh, from 1941. This, this is the basic geometry here that was followed really for another 60 years, 70 years, into the earliest uh, purpose-built mountain bikes. Th this, this particular design with the curved uh, top tube and this, this one piece on the top, uh, as opposed to the twin tube ones that Schwinn was famous for, is uh, the, the, the most rugged design that they could come up with. Th this one is basically as is, the only variation is they put, they put on the caliper brake up front because from the downhill racing they were doing, the repack race, this is the principal one, uh, you needed an extra brake. This one has a, a Brooks saddle on it. 
and also to get uh, the balance right, he actually bent the seat post back because the idea of the frame design is to have a, a proper balance between the front and the rear, you know, just like in automobiles. You, you want the right balance, but when you're going uphill or downhill, things change as it gets steeper. So th th this was thought to be and felt to be the very best design for a while. Now, they were only doing downhill racing at first, so really they were most concerned with the handling and not so much with the climbing ability of it because the bikes were not climbing bikes. They were too heavy, basically. Uh, they, d they wanted to be able to stop the bike and control the bike. So they had a long top tube. They had reinforced forks, and it gave its lateral stability as well as a safety feature. Now, the, the top tube length is uh, fairly long, and by varying the handlebars, you can actually get your, ba you can vary your balance. But you, on the downhill races, they tended to want to sit back further, so you, you'd have more control. Okay, the initial design of these bikes, you'll see this has a, a double curve top tube. The idea of this is to have the frame absorb some of the, uh, the stress or flex when, when necessary. This one here would flex less, but of course you would have more control. Charlie Kelly, who was the sponsor of the Repack Race, asked Joe Breeze to make a lightweight, purpose-built, all-terrain bike for him, as opposed to a ballooner, a clunker, downhill, uh, you know, madman's bike. He wanted a basic, all-around cross-country bike. So Joe chose to do the same geometry. This is his final version. He did many versions, uh, you know, being skilled at uh, technical drawing. And they were all done one-to-one. -one. And this is the final version from which the first 10 frames were made. Now, the tubing uh, was chrome molly aerospace tubing. And the reason being was you, you couldn't get uh, kits or tubes from uh, the bike manufacturers like Reynolds or Columbus in the appropriate sizes and lengths for what he wanted to do, at least not easily and not cheaply. So what he did is he bought 20 foot lengths of chrome molybdenum alloy tubing from an aerospace supplier and then he cut them and uh, made, made the first 10 bikes. And that's all there was. It, uh, I think. Uh, Charlie Kelly financed this bike with a total of $300, and that was enough tubing to make 10. And actually, he was short a little bit because that one has a different, has a, a track tube as a top tube. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, now, he later uh, found out it was overkill, but he decided to put these cross braces in here because they wanted an indestructible bike. It made it a little heavier, but it made it stiffer and it made it more controllable. Now you see the, the first uh, really production mountain bike here is the, uh, the, the Ritchie version of uh, Joe Breeze's idea. You see th this has aluminum uh, rims. It has all the same features of those early modified twin bikes because that's all you could get. You have a Brooks saddle, you'd have TA cranks from France, Hure derailleurs uh, from France. Uh, or Shimano or a Suntour touring derailleurs. So were the geometries of these bikes basically mimicking the older bikes or did they start changing the geometry? No, they are basically the same. They're the same from the, the Schwinn uh, DX of 1941 all the way up till the Ritchie mountain bike of 83-84. And as a the Specialized basically copied the same design, and this is from the first shipment of Specialized Stump Jumpers back there in about 1981. And you'll see everything basically is the same. Uh, it, they ha it has the aluminum uh, rims. It has a wraparound tire. Now this knobby wraparound came out about 1981. One of the first innovations was to make a very short rear end so that you could climb better. And this didn't, this happened uh, right away, you know. 
if you look at the gap there between the tire and the tube, you see if they have a very, very long chain stay. And yeah. for descending, uh, that's pretty good, it's especially if you have, to have, have, have enough length out in front of you. But for climbing, that long chain stay isn't so good. You don't get traction. You don't have as much weight on the rear wheel as you want. So one of the first innovations was to make a very short rear end so that you could climb better. This is the amount of space here. And that's the first Ritchie uh, production models. Where this one's a little bit, it's a little tighter. You see here, about an inch closer. Aha, they're getting shorter. They're getting shorter. They climb better when they're shorter. And now here are the Specialized, you can see has a, uh, a lot of distance here. The Cunningham here, aluminum one, the same, uh, it's a second generation of, uh, of modifications, is really short here. The same thing here, this is the first uh, uh, national championship winning bike. Also has a shorter uh, rear end. So what year do you think this bike is here? Uh, this is an 85. 85, yeah. okay. And that's so by the mid '80s, they started getting a little shorter. Yeah, up to even much shorter. The disadvantage is when uh, you you get to a certain inclination, you're go you're going to want to lift your front wheel. You're going to want to do your wheelie. So it has to do with your sitting down, your standing up. But in general, it's better to climb with a shorter uh, wheelbase. Now descending, there's another problem if the whole bike is too short, that you have too much weight on the front. So they started to make the top tubes longer as opposed to the previous Schwinn design. They'd, they'd have a, a, sh a longer top tube, although some of the companies uh, stuck with the shorter top tube and had a longer stem. Now, on descents, that wasn't so good. Uh, and the same companies uh, discovered that it was better to have the longer top tube. Every single aspect of suspension, every experiment and development in suspension changed the game completely. It was always start from scratch. No way of figuring out what was going to work. You can see here, this, you know, this is very tight in here, but what they do is they have to have the seat dangle really, really steep and then move the seat way back. Oh, interesting. And that's to get this shock in here, which is inside yeah. the top tube, huh? Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, there's always, seen that before. all these variations on, on here. You'll notice that these all have almost a truck-type tire. There is no tread on the sides. It doesn't wrap around at all. And that's basically all that was available was this type of tire, although there were different, many different tread designs. Like uh, this one here has like a, a, what looks to be a chain type of design, uh, chain links along the tread. This one here is uh, almost like a snow tire, the way it, the way it looks. But in general, uh, they were, you know, a fairly smooth, not totally knobby kind of tire that looked somewhat like a truck tire. So this was a tire you could get back in the 1940s? Yes, 30s and 40s and 50s. And there were, there were many uh, different designs. Let's see what we have here. Yeah, this is another tread pattern that they had. And what, what would you say the width of that tire is? Uh, those are uh, 26 by 2.125 inches, two and an eighth, two and an eighth to a, a two and a quarter. This is, this is another tread design. I imagine there were preferences depending where you lived, where you lived out east in the west, whether there's snow, whether there's mud, whether there's dust. I'm, I'm sure there were certain preferences. And many different companies were making tires. Uh, this one here, Carlisle is a famous one. One of the uh, more popular uh, brands. Uh, Firestone made them. Goodyear. General Tire and Rubber is another one. But on the very first mountain bike, you have a steel rim. That's all you could get. So that made it fairly heavy. Harder to get to, to wind it up. Uh, also, very bad for braking. So you have that combination of a tire that's not gripping so well on off-road use, plus with with rims that, let's say, it was easier to mount a tire, but there was no braking power when you're using caliper brakes. 
So that was a big disadvantage until the aluminum came along. Aluminum rims came about late 60s as it came over from the BMX world. The BMX world, uh, that would be a BMX uh, with steel uh, rims. BMX racing started 50 years ago, uh, 51 years ago now, uh, 1969. That was the first racing. But before then, people would modify their bikes just like the mountain bike people did to make BMX uh, type of bikes. So it wasn't formal racing yet, but they would modify them in the same way that the modifying the, the bigger bikes. But what happened was, once the racing got started, these uh, manufacturers started making custom components for them. So aluminum rims came into it, because you want acceleration off the line for the BMX bikes. And those rims were the ones that were made in a larger size that were then applied to the mountain bike. Uh, first, Joe Breeze made uh, t uh, 10 breezers. And, those, and, and then Richie, not have, being able to get one in his size, made a, one, a personal bike and two more, one of them for Gary Fisher. So at this point, there were only 13 purpose-built lightweight mountain bikes in the world. And they had what sourced what they thought were all the best components at the time. But none of them had wraparound tires, like knobby tires like this. None of them had aluminum rims. So this, the uh, BMX rims uh, started to be made in a larger size. They, you know, they, would, they would extrude the rim and it would be formed. And rather than make a 20 inch, they could make a 26 inch. And that happened all about the same time. Now there was an interesting evolution uh, in that the BMX dads would want to go out for a ride with their kids. So the BMX manufacturers, Pro Cruisers one, decided they would make a, a 26 inch uh, version of the bike. And they were the first ones to make the aluminum rims that were immediately used by the mountain bike people. You'll see this one has that same truck type of tire, almost a flat tread, but an aluminum rim. And the, the, one of the industry people uh, explained to us briefly, their idea was they're going to make a bike so the dad can go and ride along with the kids. But the kids at that age were growing so fast, by the time they got it on the, on the market, the kids were, were big enough to ride these big bikes. So all of a sudden, it was, there was a crossover between the BMX scene and the mountain bike scene. And it you know, stimulated the imagination of both sides. BMX racing, probably, probably simultaneous or even a little bit ahead of the mountain bike uh, uh, phenomena, developed this tire where you could actually corner and had different kinds of treads. Uh, all the people making the first mountain bikes really appreciated this, and they started to experiment with the different treads. Like, you see if on uh, this bike, this is really, a, looks to be a very heavy tire, uh, absolutely impossible to corner. Uh, the, the famous downhill race, the repack, the guys would be more or less uh, going like a BMX, I mean, a motocross racers, where they'd have their leg out, and they'd be using the hiking boots and skidding around because the tires weren't holding, so they had to use every technique that they could find. One of the early innovators was Charlie Cunningham, who made the first aluminum bikes. But he would get the tires here, as legend goes, would stay up for hours with an X-Acto knife, cutting a new tread pattern. So here's, an, here's another one that they did with a the, with the new compound here. This is his wife's bike, the first uh, na uh, national champion, woman's national champion. So he would come up and, and cut uh, out uh, different tread patterns. So I imagine he had blanks or other kinds of uh, uh, tires that he would modify. Charlie Cunningham was partners in WTB. And WTB was one of the first innovators and the first people with many, many designs. But at the same time, so was Mike Senyard of Specialized. And before Specialized did their stump jumper, uh, he really, his main business was making tires for racing bikes. And so he was making 700C tires and 27 inch tires by one inch. So these are for lightweight bikes. But he had experience in making tires and having them manufactured overseas. 
So his business experience helped him in being very quick with the mountain bike and the one that you know is basically almost as good as the uh, Ritchie, but at half the price. Now Charlie Cunningham also worked with them, and I'm not sure of the details. You'll have to have to look up the details of uh, how WTB crossed over with uh, Specialized, because Charlie Cunningham uh, designated some of his first tires as the ground control tire, and they still have a model of tire called ground control to this day, and. Uh, probably coming from the song Rocket Man or something like mm. that. And, uh, so the ground control tire was and still is a specialized product, but also WTB started at about the same time, and it was a group of several of the other innovators, Steve Potts and Charlie and a few other people. And they, they were together and they've each gone their separate ways since then. But those were, are two of the main uh, innovators. And when we start to go look at the different names on them, we'll you know, be able to come up with some of the, uh, you know, trace some of the other uh, evolutionary paths of the tire. This bicycle here, brand new to the collection, is an 1898 Pierce. And Pierce is a company that later made the Pierce Aero automobile. Pierce, Arrow, and the Duesenberg were the Rolls Royces of American automobile building. Now, this is an original bike, kept in really good shape. It, it has dual suspension. It has an oil spring rear suspension, and it pivots about the crank uh, here, and up and down, and it has a front leaf spring, dual leaf spring front fork, with a piece of leather in between so that it doesn't, doesn't make any noise when it's flexing. So you could see this, this whole thing will flex like so. A very finely machined, beautiful nickel plating on it. It has a, a, a nice wraparound tread on it. semi balloon tire. It has a, a, a wonderful handlebar uh, uh, idea with a, a ratchet in here. So if you, if you undo this bolt, you can move the handlebars forward, upside down, upside down, forward, uh, asymmetrical if you want. Uh, beautiful cork hand grips with, uh, with nickel-plated plugs. And get, get up high, you can see one, a wonderful adjustment for the seat post. And an anatomical saddle, well, very much like the ones today. You'll see there's a cutout in it. And, has a horsehair inside and uh, you know, precision stitching on it. This one has a shaft drive and it has a, a rear coaster brake. Most of the bikes of the era were fixies. You, you couldn't stop pedaling. You would try to back pedal to slow down and depend usually on your front brake. This one doesn't have a front brake because of the suspension fork, but it has a coaster brake. So two things, you, you can back pedal to uh, to affect braking, or you can coast, which was an uh, innovation in those days. And at the time, there were, even on the market, two and three speed versions of this shaft drive, which really comes out of uh, locomotive uh, design. I can, I can show you the locomotive. Would this be the original gravel bike? Uh, they're all original gravel bikes. There was only gravel in those days, unless they were cobblestones or uh, bricks. Bricks would be the ultimate. <laughs> Smooth brick road. This one has a more primitive look to it. But it was a shaft drive. That's really neat. So this shaft is actually inside the, yes, the chain stay. Yes, it's inside. Well, well they, we wouldn't call it a chain stay. It's called the shaft stay. Yes. Like this, yeah. Now, there are, there are other versions, like for, for racing and sprinting, where they have braces, like dual braces, as well as this. Wow. So what year again was this one? This is 1895. 1895. 1894, I'm sorry. 1894. Wow. That is really amazing. I mean, it really hasn't changed a whole lot. Yeah. This A-frame style down, down tube, I guess. Yeah. That's really cool. I wonder how these solid rubber tires felt on. Uh... Yeah. Well, these uh, they, they, they were pneumatic tires. Oh, in those, those days. are pneumatic. Uh, they they would have been pneumatic. Some of them, for display purposes, uh, have solid tires. Okay. And a lot of the bikes you'll see at some point people were restoring bikes 
chose to get a imitation tire that was solid so they wouldn't have to keep pumping it out. So these would, you, you'd call them display tires or they would fill them up with foam or something like I this. See. And, and, and unfortunately when that happens, like, like this bike, the, this is a tire that's probably filled up with something. You can't really get an impression of what the, how light it was because sometimes it adds a couple pounds to it. Mm. And so this is, you know, this is a aluminum bike uh, that you'll see. Uh, this is aluminum? Yeah, there's a cast aluminum bike. Cast aluminum. Oh uh, yeah, from from 1895. No way. And you see what a beautiful fork there is. You know, it looks very much a, a very modern design. And the anatomical saddle as beautiful as anything nowadays. 1895, yeah. all aluminum. Yeah. Cast aluminum. Cast aluminum. That yeah. is incredible. I had no idea. I thought the first aluminum bike came out in the 80s. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, here, there's a little bit. I have a little bit of literature here. All, all of these things have a file. There's, uh, there's, there's one set up for touring. Yeah. 10,916 miles covered to date. 10,000 miles. Uh, on this, on this bike. Uh, well, this fellow's version of it. He has oh, a okay. full chain guard on it. But and he didn't break the fork? No, no, no. Um, uh, they, they've gone through a, they went through a, an evolution, also, but uh, so you know, constantly one. improving it. Wow, that's a cast aluminum fork. Yeah, the whole frame really is cast, so it's not really raised together. Yeah, I see. That's incredible. Yeah, you can see that. This is... Now here's another. You'll see, look when you look at earlier spokes, you'll see that the magnet will stay on it. Later spokes, especially uh, nowadays, are non-magnetic because there's so much uh, nickel and, and chrome in it to make stainless steel uh, spokes that you can't get a magnet to stick to it. But if you look at the earlier ones, or even some of the special track bikes, they have a, 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 a stronger steel spoke that you'd have to take care of it so it wouldn't rust, but it's stronger, it's lighter, you can make it thinner, and it has different characteristics. And also it responds to a magnet. This is one thing I'm going around. So I, I got this out because I wanted to check the rims because some of the rims are deceptive to see you know which ones, which ones were magnetic and which weren't. So. Thank you very much, Will. It's I really been, appreciate all the time you spent. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And please come back. Oh, absolutely. Come back for more. And uh, we'll get down on our hands and knees and you know, yeah. look at the bikes. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. So before I go, I'd like to thank the Marin Bicycle Museum and Will for taking the time and sharing your insights into the evolution of the mountain bike, the frame geometry, and the tires, and some of the other interesting things that we learned in this video today. If any of you happen to be in the Fairfax or Marin County area, I highly recommend stopping by the Marin Bicycle Museum. It's an incredible resource. Uh, if some of you out there can't make it, but would like to help out the museum, I'm gonna put a link down below to their website where you can donate or you can purchase an autographed book, for example, and uh, anything you buy should help out the museum. So anyway, I really appreciate all of you for watching, and uh, until next time, have a wonderful evening.